that your habits, those things that you do either consciously or unconsciously every single day, your habits, those things that you do all the time, they are absolutely the greatest determiner of your success, your happiness and joy, your financial stability, and your relational satisfaction. Now, that may not be a really encouraging thing to start with because you're like, man, my habits kind of stink. In fact, last week I asked you the question, where will the choices that you make today drive you tomorrow? And and maybe as you've been thinking about it this week and you've been looking at this year and you go, man, I really want to make some changes, you realize you're like, wow, there are some significant changes that I have to make. Or maybe you're looking like we talked about, that internal GPS system, right? Those, Those natural defaults that you've created over the years whether it's procrastination, whether it's getting upset, whether it's you know, pa- panic or anxiety or fear, whether it's overcompensation, whatever, those natural defaults that you have kind of set into your internal GPS, you're looking at that and you're going, man, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. I'm, I'm not excited about what I'm seeing, and I'm certainly not excited about where that's going to take me. So maybe... This week, you've been processing, like, okay, I'm going to make some changes. I'm just going to make, I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to do some things differently. I'm going to change this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to process through this. I'm going to alter this. But here's the thing, and I'll just start kind of with this this morning. Change isn't easy, okay? In fact, really quick, look at the person to your eye, to your left, and go, change is hard. Just really, just change is hard, right? So for those of you that are like, I don't like talking to people, and I got in a fight with them this morning, so change is hard, right? Just change is hard. Change is a difficult thing to do. Even the people, here's what's funny. I love change. I love moving things around, but I have found in certain areas in my life, I am absolutely someone that doesn't like change. There are certain areas I'm like, don't mess with that. That is how I do things. Leave me alone. I'm not going to change it. I'm not going to alter that. But change, even if you love change, can be a difficult thing to actually be able to, to accomplish and to be able to do. But if we really boil it down and we really understand that our habits, those things that we do consciously or unconsciously every single day, they actually are the driving, determining factor of our success, our failure, our joy, our happiness, our financial stability, our relational satisfaction, all of those different things, then we have to actually ask the question, what can we do when we discover that our habits kind of suck? Well, what is it that we can do? What, when we actually look at our habits and we actually recognize, wow, these habits are bad, And we understand that we go, man, we look at our habits and we're like, listen, our life is essentially a sum of all of our habits. You're like, well, I'm not sure I'm buying with you. Just let's go there. The shape that you are in or out is all a matter of your habits, right? Whether you exercise, uh, whether you eat the right types of things or you don't eat the right types of things, whether or not you decide that really... Instead of actually doing something physically uh, active, I'm going to binge watch 17 seasons of X, and I'm going to sit here with popcorn, and I'm not just going to do regular popcorn, I'm going to do the movie butter popcorn, or I'm going to do the kettle corn popcorn with sugar and honey and all that stuff. I, you know, I'm just going to, see, it, it's just, a, it's just a, a result of your habits. The same thing is true uh, with your, your joy, the happiness, Right? the decisions that you make. If the smallest thing upsets you and you're always cranky, that is a habit. You have a habit of something upsetting you, you immediately pop off and you're constantly unhappy. And people look at you like, you know, you have the determination of your happiness. No, I don't. The circumstances around me. But here's what you have control of. You have control of how you respond to your circumstances. And that is actually what determines whether or not you have happiness or joy and all those different things. It's the same thing with our success. Now, I know people are like, well, yeah, but I know this person, and they were born to this person, and they had all these opportunities, and yeah, that's right. We're just going to be real honest about that. So when I was a kid, I thought, man, I would love to be a professional sport player of some kind. I didn't even care. Like, literally, I'm like, baseball, basketball, soccer really wasn't a sport back then. Um, all these different things. It was unfortunate it was the best one I was at. But all these different things, right? And I thought, I'm going to do this. But then I, I realized, I, I looked at who my dad, my dad is five foot six on a good day. Five foot seven with a little elevation going on, right? 
And he was a farmer. He, I mean, he was somewhat athletic. My, my grandfather was six foot. I have an uncle, though, who is six six, and he played semi-pro basketball. So I thought, well, this is it, right? That's what I'm going to do. I can't hit free throws to save my life. So that just didn't work out. And so you see, there's, there's the, the stuff that comes part of your natural, your natural talent and ability. You can't control that. What you're good at, you're good at. What you're not, you're not. Your opportunities that you get because you know somebody, you can't control that. But you know, those two things are actually only a small percentage of why people are successful. If you actually look at the people who are quote-unquote successful, in whatever field it is that you're in that you want to be successful, the people that are actually the most successful are the ones who have the habits necessary to do what's necessary to be successful. So even in this area of your life and and your your career and all those different things, it all boils down to your habits. In fact, here's the big idea for today. My my habits, my habits ultimately form the person that I am. Now think about that for a second. Your habits literally form the person who you are. They also form the things that I believe the things I believe to be true, the things I don't believe to be true, and then finally, the personality that I portray. So my habits, my habits will form the person that I am, they will form the things that I believe, and the personality I portray. If people say to you, you know what, your personality is a little like a porcupine, that goes down to your habits. It's, it's how you react, how you respond. If you're like, well, I'm not so sure I believe in this. Well, how do you demonstrate belief? You act upon it, right? For, for example, this morning, when you all came in, how many of you, when you came in, checked to make sure that the chair was actually going to hold your weight? Anybody? Okay, cool. You had faith when you walked in. You believed because of your habits, right? You sat down in your chair. You sat down in a chair a billion times, and only maybe a couple of times has it actually collapsed on you. And I've had that happen. Tracy's had that happen. It's exciting stuff. But only a couple of times. And so you, with your habits, right? You sit down. In fact, some of you, some of you didn't even do this. Like you just went down gently. Some of you, like I've, I watched you. So you like lift your legs up. You slap in there like this. You're like ah. Oh. Done for the day. Because why? That's your habit. And that forms something that you believe. You believe that the chair is going to hold you, so you don't even think about it. It's a habit. You see, our habits literally form everything and who we are. In fact, this is interesting. A study done by Duke University, the School of of Psychology at Duke University, discovered, uh, it was a seven-year study, they discovered that over 40% of your actions, your attitudes, and your behaviors are all dictated by your habits. So almost half of your life, almost half of your life is completely determined by the dumb habits that you don't even think about. And I say dumb because it's like we don't think about them, right? Not that they're dumb habits. Like getting up early isn't necessarily a dumb habit, right? It's just just a habit. But those habits, they form and and create 40% or more of your life. So through your habits, you can literally take control of almost half of your life and make it circumstance repellent, make it overwhelming repellent, make it what other people do or act or behave on repellent. So half of your life, simply by having the correct habits, the habits that God would have you do as a follower of Jesus Christ, you can buy circumstance insurance. Think about that. In fact, here's the interesting thing when we really process through it. For those of you that kind of feel like your life is out of control or you don't have any control of your life, if we want to be really honest with ourselves and we want to actually take a gut level honest look at our lives, here's what we realize. That at least half of the reason that we are and are in what we are in is 100% because of me, not me, not Dave Crandall. Like, so we're like, oh, I'm sending you an email. You jerk, you've messed up my life. No, no, us, individually, the choices that we make. Now, granted, there's stuff that happens to us, right? There are people that do things. There are circumstances. We understand that. But those are things usually beyond our control. But over half of your life, you can literally just take control by simply doing habits 
that actually move you in the direction you want to go. So here's what I'm going to do today. <clears throat> my, my Baptist background got to me today, and so if you'll notice, the first letter of all five points are, spell out the word habit. Are you, those of you that are note takers, I hope you noticed that already. I did that specifically just for you so that you could actually see this. So I'm just going to share with you five things, okay? So if you are trying to develop a new habit, <clears throat> you're trying to break old habit, you're trying to just start a habit that you know you need to start, in which case you need to break a habit, these are the five things that you need to do, okay? And we're just going to walk through them today. The first one is this you need to actually have a written down plan. You need to actually have a written down plan. Now I know we love, I, I'm, I'm one of those people that love to think about stuff, right? And I, and I process things. But here's, there's, there's magic, and I say that with quotes around it, right? There is magic in writing stuff down. There's magic in it. It's like when you write it down, you actually go, I think I can actually do that. And when you sit down, and you actually write out, this is the habit, this is the goal, these are the changes that I want to make. There is something permanent about it. And I'm just going to be real honest with you, this is where I come from, okay? I am not a taking notes on a computer or on a, on a phone thing. For me, there is something more powerful when I take a notepad and my, my pen and I physically write it down on a piece of paper. Now, I know some of you are like, I haven't used a piece of paper since birth, but for those of you that are like, man, I've never tried that, maybe try that because there's something about using your other senses, you know, right? Your, your feeling, your, your eyesight, you hear it and you speak it out to yourself, not like you're speaking into existence, but like literally you're, you're writing it out, you're using your senses, it becomes more ingrained in your person, in your character. You go, wow, I think I can do this. And there are three R's. This is for free. There are three R's in, in new habits, okay? There's three simple things. There's the reminder, right? You have to create some type of reminder, whether it's a note card, whether it's a, a, a reminder on your phone that goes off at certain times. You have to have a reminder to start a new habit. You also have to have a routine. When are you going to do it? What time are you going to do it? How often are you going to do it? You have to have a routine. Then you also have to have a reward. If you do this, what are you going to give yourself? You're like, hey, you know what? I, I want to do X, and I'm going to reward myself with a pair of new sneakers. Now, if you're married, check with your spouse first to make sure that's okay that you buy a pair of new sneakers. But also, like literally, you're going to reward yourself with something, right? Or you're like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to go on a diet, and I'm going to not, not eat any carbs for the rest of this year. And, you know, just warn the people that love you because you're going to be cranky for a while before you get over that. I'm going to eat any more carbs. But then your reward is at the end of two months if I don't eat any carbs I'm going to go get a pizookie and it's going to be awesome and it's going to have ice cream it's going to be phenomenal I'm just going to have a wonderful day and just enjoy that and that's your reward for being able to actually do that so have a written down plan write all these out Proverbs chapter 21 verse 5 the plans of the diligent certainly lead to advantage so literally, if you write it out, if you have a plan, you're intentional, you lay those things out, that actually gives you a leg up on actually accomplishing the habit that you want to do. But then listen to this. But everyone who is in a hurry certainly comes to poverty. This is something that's very important. With your written down plan, you have to be honest with yourself and realize, really quickly, I'm just going to ask you, just all say it out loud, um, I'm on count of three, tell me how old you are. Okay, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, cool. I heard a whole lot of 20s. The rest of you were real quiet. So <clears throat> it took you that long to become this way. Don't anticipate that tomorrow it's going to change. Notice this is the plans of the diligent. That word also can mean the, the plans of the persistent the people that are going to do it no matter what. But if you get in a hurry, if it's got to happen tomorrow, you're probably going to fall and you're probably going to fail. And avoid using negative plans too, such as um, I'm not going to uh, or I'm going to stop doing these things. Because when you do that, what happens is your mind kind of gloms onto the negative. Interesting, a, a guy who's another psychologist from University of Texas, uh, his name's Arthur Markham. He says this about how our brain works. The brain's habit of learning uh, doesn't really learn anything by not doing it. Does that make sense, doesn't it, when you, when you say that loud? The brain never learns anything by not doing it. Instead, you need, a need to frame your goals in terms of what you are going to do and the positive outcomes that they will create. 
So instead of, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop, say, no, 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 okay, I'm going to do this instead of this. And the reason where it's important to mess with our habits is because habits ultimately form the person I am, the things I believe, and the personality I portray. A, alter your environment. So not only do you have to have a written plan, but then secondly, when you get your plan written out, you need to alter your surroundings. Now, not like, okay, you people need to leave this house. But like, you need to alter your environment, the things that are around you. Psalm uh, 1, 1 through 4 says this, God blesses those people who refuse evil advice and who won't follow sinners or join in the sneering at God. Instead, the law of the Lord makes them happy, and they think about it all day and night. They are like trees growing beside a stream, trees that produce fruit in season and always have leaves. These people succeed in everything they do. This isn't true of those who are evil because they are like straw blown by the wind. Now, what's the difference between the tree and the straw? It's location. It's their environment. The straw is out in the field. If it doesn't rain, guess what? The straw dies. If the tree is next to the water and it doesn't rain, it's still next to the water. It still has its location next to its source. So your environment can be all sorts of areas. Here at Friendship, we, we encourage three specific areas. Your spiritual environment, your relationship to God, and that's part of that stream of water. Your relational environment, the people that you surround yourself with, and your financial environment, how you handle your money. Those three things, if you have those three things in that environment correct, then you are going to be able to, no matter what happens in your life, to be able to weather the storm and be able to get through it. And so if you're looking at your habits and you have this written out plan, begin to actually look for things that you go, okay, I need to make sure that I alter this as well. Because by the way, when you change one habit, it's kind of like a domino effect, isn't it? Other things begin to change. And so it's the same thing with your environment. If you go, okay, you know what? I realize that the people that I spend most of my time with give terrible advice. I realize the people that I spend time with, they're not people I should hang out with. I realize that I spend more time Netflix, Hulu, Philo, I can't remember any others, but the HBO Max, Disney Plus, I spend more time sitting in front and listening to the Hollywood people than I do spend time listening to the God of the universe who actually knows what he's talking about. I need to alter my environment to make sure I am by that stream of water that's going to give me the resources that I need. So have a written plan. Alter your environment. B, begin small. Begin small. Now, I know some of you are like, what? What did he, did he say begin small? I thought we were supposed to. Doesn't God want us to go big all the time? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. In fact, the reality is, is as uh, Brandon shared with us in the first week, the little things sometimes make the biggest difference those little changes that we make in our lives. Uh, Dave Ramsey likes to call it being a bully, going after the tiniest debt that you have first and knocking that sucker out, right? Just leverage everything to take that guy out because then you have a win. And if you can begin and you can start with the smallest habit, do something like, listen, I'm gonna actually brush my teeth every day. First of all, all of us will be appreciative of that. Those of you that are middle school boys, deodorant is another thing that you might wanna think about putting on every day, taking showers, Things like that, like little things, right? Just start with a little thing that you can do no matter what, and you begin to build your momentum. And we think about, wow, I, you know, God wants these sweeping massive changes. Deuteronomy chapter 7, 22. This is such a cool verse when it comes to this. The, God had just given them the nation of Israel. They were getting ready to take over everything. And he says, listen, I'm going to give you instructions. And you would think this would be God's instructions, right? God would say, listen, go into the land, wipe everybody out immediately, clear it all out, get rid of everybody, take everything over. But listen to his instructions. The Lord your God will drive those nations out ahead of you how? Little by little. And then notice the reason why. This is so practical. Little by little. You will not clear them away all at once. Otherwise, the wild animals would multiply too quickly for you to handle. I love that. We take that and we apply it to our habits, right? If you try to take out everything at once, you're, you're not going to be successful. It's going to overwhelm you. You're going to get eaten alive. But if you take little by little and you start making those small changes, those small habits, those things that you can be a 
habit bully and just beat them into submission and make those changes and be able to do those things, then you will start to be successful. A guy, <clears throat> you may or may not know him, if you're in the business world, you probably know his name is Jim Rohn. He says the success is a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Success is a few simple disciplines practiced every day, but failure is simply a few errors in judgment repeated every day. The truth is, is that both sides, habits can be created either positive or negative. Good habits are made by wise decisions and wise choices. Bad habits are errors in judgment, bad choices, emotional decisions. Either one of them, you do them often enough, they become habits. And habits are the things that ultimately determine the person that you are, the things that you believe, and the personality that you betray. In fact, Proverbs kind of lays this out on the negative side, Proverbs 6, 10 through 11. A little sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit and scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Now, I am not a morning person. Anybody else here not a morning person? Okay, praise the Lord. See, this is why we get along so well. I'm not a morning person. And when my alarm goes off, the first thought that goes through my brain is to take that phone that is sitting next to my bed and throw it as hard as I can against the wall. That, that's my first thought. I mean, that's, that's just kind of like, but here's, here's the verse that goes through my head, right? It's like, hey, listen, a little, little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and scarcity and poverty will come on you like a bandit. It will beat you up and throw you by the side of the road. That's what's going to happen. Get your butt out of bed. you got to get going. You got This is the way it's got to go. This is, this is the things that we have to think at, to ourselves and process to ourselves to be able to make these changes little by little. Okay, so have a written down plan. Alter your environment. Begin small. I. Identify points of potential failure. Identify points of potential failure. If you're an engineer, you've already thought about this, because that's like your job. It's like, well, okay, where's it going to fail? That's, that's what I want to figure out where the failure is going to be. But here's what we really do. We start making changes. We decided we start want to make uh, new decisions and new habits in our life. We begin to struggle because we don't recognize that there's going to be pushback. If you start making changes in your life, there's always going to be pushback. It may actually be from your family that you get some pushback. It may be from the people that you hang out with that you get pushback. But I'll tell you, the greatest level of pushback comes from yourself. Because you're starting to make changes on the inside. You're starting to change how you view things, how you think about things, how you believe about things, and you're going to get pushed back inside of you. In fact, the reality is I have discovered I can convince myself or convince myself out of anything. I have the ability to do unbelievable mental gymnastics. Anybody with me? You know what I'm talking about? Like literally, let's go back to the alarm clock for a second. You're like, I'm going to get up early. I'm going to set my alarm up. I'm going to get up, and it's going to be so great. And I'm going to get up, and I'm going to work out, and then I'm going to only drink water. I'm not going to drink any coffee, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. And your alarm goes off, and you, and you hit snooze. And you hit snooze not because you're not going to get up. You hit snooze because, you know what, I didn't sleep great last night. And then, then it goes off a second time, and you hit snooze again because, you know, you really never fell back to sleep. After you push news, and you know what, your back, your back's a little sore, back's a little sore. And then you get up, and you're like, okay, I, I finally got up. Uh, you know what, P boy, I tell you what, I, I've got a lot to do today. If I work out and I'm sore, like literally we do this, don't we? We're just, we just working through this whole process. And so before you begin, you literally have to begin to look at what are the points of potential failure? What are the things that trigger the quit response? What are the things that trigger that quit response. Those of you that are like, hey, I wanted to work out this year, the quit response probably happens uh, the morning after you worked out the first time. And you go to hit your snooze and you're like, like this, right? Because you can't move your arms. And the quit response is, I'm not, that hurts too much. I'm going to stop. Or maybe it's other things. But we have that quit response. So begin by looking at that and figuring out the things that could potentially go wrong. What are the things that could potentially trip you up. In fact, Proverbs calls this prudence. Listen to this, Proverbs 27, 12. The prudent sees danger 
and hides himself. The prudent person looks down the road and goes, okay, if I'm going to do this, this is going to happen or this potentially could happen. So here's what I need to do. I need to avoid that. I need to move over here. For example, let's say that your goal this year is to not be on your phone while you're driving. Not pointing that out to anybody, but you're not going to be on your phone while you're driving. So instead of putting your phone where it's readily accessible to you, you get a phone holder that's just over here where you can see what it says if a text comes in, but you can't really mess with it. And so you change, again, alter your environment. You know where the potential failure is going to be because if you put it in your pocket or you put it underneath your right butt cheek because that's what, you know, you can just pull that out real quick, then you know you're going to use it. So you move it, you change, you move things away from the potential failure failure but then notice what it says is but the simple go on they're like I, I, I can I can handle it and what happens to them they suffer for it they suffer for it it is not macho manly tough or wise to run into a brick wall to prove yourself it's always better to just simply go around it okay so look at that now <clears throat> There's another thing, though. There, there, are, there are those of you, and I'm not going to point, I'm not going to look, because the minute I do this, someone's going to be like, oh, you're talking to me, and I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to look down at my notes here, and I'm going to say this, okay? There are some of you that are overanalyzers. Just saying. There are some of you that are overanalyzers. You make lists, and you make spreadsheets, and you think about it, and you talk about it, but you never do anything. Because you're always overthinking it. Now, you're not going to like this, but I'm just going to be really honest with you. This is what the Bible says you are. The Bible says that you are a slacker. In fact, I have a little video that will help us reinforce what it means to be a slacker. Chuck, let's go ahead and play that. Oh, yes, sir. You've got a real attitude problem, McFly. You're a slacker. You remind me of your father when he went here. He was a slacker too. Generational slackers right there. Vice Principal Strickland called you a slacker. I didn't call you a slacker. In fact, the reality is, is that God calls you a slacker. Proverbs chapter 26, 13. The slacker says, there's a lion in the road. There's too much risk. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about it. I think there might be something out there. I might fail. I might fall on my face. I might this. I might that. There's a line in the public square, right? Because everything's too much of a risk. And we think we're being cautious, but what we're really being is unwilling to make the change necessary because of fear, because of worry, because of anxiety, whatever. But we're unwilling to do that. And we need to do that because our habits ultimately form the person that I am, the things I believe, and the personality that I portray. So here we go, the T. Tell someone. Tell someone. Have a written plan. Alter your environment. Begin small. Be intentional and, and find out what those, those, uh, those things are that could potentially trip you up. And then T, tell someone. Tell someone about it. You go, I don't want to tell someone. Do you know why you don't want to tell someone? Because when you fail, they'll be like, hey, how are things going? You're like, shut up. I don't want to hear about it. You don't want to tell anybody because you are building in your ability to not do it later on when it gets hard, when the painful pinch begins to take place and you go, okay, I'm not going to do this anymore because, because I, I've only told myself, yeah, I wrote it down, I can burn that paper. They told me to write it on paper, I can burn that, it's not even on the computer, it's good, I'm good to go. But if you tell someone, then it's out there, isn't it? I'm going to be honest with you, sometimes... The reason we don't tell someone is because we're afraid that they will make a joke at our expense. They'll make fun of us. They'll pick on us. But also sometimes the reason we don't tell anybody is we don't want to be held accountable. We want to build in that ability to fail. And that's called, it, that's called building in failure. And the reality is a lot of us do that. And so if you've got something that God's working on your heart and God's working on your mind, you're like, man, this is a habit I need to change, and you begin to work through this process, don't stop until you get to the T. 
and tell someone. Tell someone that you trust. Tell someone that can be honest with you. Tell someone that you can say, hey, listen, I'm struggling with this. I'm, you know, I really, I fell off the wagon. I, I really, I really struggled. I, I need to do this. And someone that you can talk to. Listen, this, I love this. Paul is writing to the people in Rome. He'd never met them before. But he loves them because he sees what they've gone through. And he says, listen, when I come, I want to do some things for you, but I also want to get some things for you. It's this kind of mutual encouragement and accountability. He says, what, when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be about. We're supposed to encourage each other, challenge each other. The book of, book of Proverbs says, this iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens or encourages one another. And that's the way that it's supposed to be. But if you don't tell anybody, then you'll never get that encouragement. You'll never get that accountability. You'll never have that kind of extra umph to be able to overcome it. Now, <clears throat> I want to end with just straight talk, okay? So we started this morning by saying to the person next to you, change is hard. We're going to end with something equally as encouraging, all right? Look at the person to your right, look at the person to your left, and here's what I want you to tell them. You're going to fail. Just tell them, right? Just, you're, you're going to fail. <coughs> Not like, ha-ha, you're going to fail, but like, hey, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. Do you realize that failing is not the ultimate determination of whether or not you've been successful? The ultimate determination of whether or not you get and, and you become successful is not if you fail. It's if you get back up. Listen to this passage, Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. The godly may trip seven times. Notice, it doesn't say a person may trip. It says the godly. This is a person, a man or woman, loves God, is passionate for God, is following God, has changed habits, has worked through these things. He says, listen, that godly person, they may trip and fall seven times, but here is the difference between a person who is passionately pursuing Christ and a person who's just trying to make a better life. Listen to this. But they will get up again. But a disaster is enough to overthrow the wicked. One disaster, one difficulty, one hardship. You know the difference between people who just want to improve themselves? Eventually they give up on themselves. But the truth is, you're not trying to improve yourself because of yourself. You are improving yourself to be more like Christ. And when you're improving yourself to become more like Christ, then the power of Christ is working in you and with you. And you're not doing it by yourself. You're doing it through and in Christ to become more like Christ. It's not like you're sitting there like we talked about in the second week. You're holding on and you're waiting for that autopilot to just give up knowing it's never going to. And finally you fail and you just put your hands up and you go back to what you've been doing before. The truth of the matter is, is that whether or not you're going to be successful in this is whether or not you're willing to get back up. But so many people have fallen and unfortunately the response sometimes of Christians is <laughs> that they give up. God has not called you to lay on the ground. God's not called you to stay still. He's called you to get back up. So get back up. Maybe your background has been an absolute mess. Relationally, spiritually, financially, get back up. Maybe you've struggled day after day, get back up. Just get back up and try again. Because as long as you're still breathing, God still has a purpose and a plan for your life. So get back up. Father, we thank you so much.